You're listening to Graphic Novel Explorers Club Podcast, an audio book club. Greetings, Explorers. I am one of your hosts, Aubrey, joined by... Dennis. And... <laughs> Johnny. Am I? Are you guys there? <laughs> Is he? <laughs> <laughs> Today we are discussing Richard Stark's Parker, The Outfit, adapted and illustrated by Darwin Cook. We hope you have read today's title because all three of us have read the book, so beware, spoilers ahead. Become an official explorer by joining our Patreon group. Explorers get early access to episodes, specials, polls, discussions, and other extras. Graphic Novel Explorers Club is available wherever fine podcasts are found, including YouTube. So be sure to subscribe and leave a review. That's right, Explorers. We're reading Richard Stark's Parker, The Outfit, adapted and illustrated by the late, great Darwin Cook. The Outfit is the second book in the comic series. We looked at the first book, adapted by Darwin Cook, Richard Starks, Parker the Hunter. This is such a, there's so many, <laughs> it's such a long title. All the books have long titles. We looked at it in episode 11. And, uh, and then there's also a Parker-esque story featured in Batman Ego called Catwoman, Selena's Big Score, which we covered in episode 60, or episode 67. All four of the books that were published by IDW are The Hunter in 2009, The Outfit in 2010, The Score in 2012, and Slayground in 2014. Cook had planned on adapting more of the stories, but he passed in 2016. And I guess they had an eight-year contract to do the four books, but he did them so quickly that he had talked to the estate and they were going to allow him to do two, two or three more, but unfortunately he passed away before that could happen. Uh, Richard Stark was the pen name of Donald E. Westlake. The Parker stories have been adapted into several movies, including 1967's Point Blank, starring Lee Marvin, 1968's The Split, starring Jim Brown, 1973's The Outfit, starring Robert Duvall, which is, that movie was based on this book, 1999's Payback, starring Mel Gibson, and most recently, 2013's Parker, starring Jason Statham. As you guessed it, Parker. There's been many more than just these uh there's been uh unofficial adaptations unauthorized adaptations that were not still to this day have not been allowed to be shown in the united states because they didn't get the proper licensing to adapt the story uh in all of these movies except the most recent one parker uh they made donald westlake aka richard stark wouldn't allow them to use the name Parker for some reason. He didn't allow them to do that. I think a lot of the reasons because they weren't doing, uh, he wanted a more straight adaptation that was like of the era set in the 60s and early 60s and they went through that. However, Westlake was impressed with Cook's take on the character, especially setting the stories in the early 60s and being faithful to the prose of the story. They ended up collaborating on the first book, which resulted in Westlake allowing Cook to adapt multiple stories and sadly, Westlake passed before the first book uh, of their collaboration was published. That might have been honestly a benefit. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, having read both books, I found the first one to be more problematic. While the second book is a little more straightforward, I feel like even though they're only a year apart in terms of publishing, some of the problems I had with the first book, I didn't have with this one it was a lot less misogynistic he didn't just outright kill civilians <laughs> uh i feel like a lot of the problems were solved and so maybe without the author kind of hovering above him he was able to kind of self-edit and adapt the story but perhaps tone down some of the problematic elements that i had at least with the first book I think that's more on Westlake than um, Cook because yeah. they're pretty much straight adaptations of the stories. Like that was another thing that got Westlake to agree to it was like he kept a lot of the Cook kept a lot of the story details and the writing in the book in the, in his adaptations. Where whereas like so I think maybe Westlake for whatever reason in that story there's just less civilians getting killed and women getting killed yeah it's very possible i would have to compare it uh, absolutely i mean uh, i guess i would give credit to the author if that's the case in terms of him dropping some of those elements 
it's just interesting that from book one to two, it's dramatically different in terms of the body count, who gets hurt, and such uh, comparatively. Wasn't Darwin Cook more of an artist and an animator, too? Yeah, he got started as a graphic designer, and then he segued into... He did a lot of work on the Batman the Animated Series, and I think Justice League after that, before transitioning into comics. That makes a lot of sense to me, because, and I'm also glad... Wait, that was going to come out wrong. I'm not (laughs) glad he's dead. I'm not glad he's dead. I just am glad he'll never hear me say anything bad about this book. <laughs> I, well, I was just going to say that I like the art. The art is lovely and the, the graphic design is lovely. But I oh, I'm sorry. I only read the first book. So it's very interesting. I'm glad the second book was better because I read the first one and could not. I tried to get into the second one. And I was just like too, too much like, nah, I've been here before. I can't do this again <laughs> because I hated the first book so much so I, because of the misogyny and the, and the violence against women that I couldn't keep going. But it also makes sense as far as the first book goes that he was more of an artist than a writer because the first book just felt like some of it was just like it took entire book pages and just slammed them down and then put some pretty art next to it. But like it was like there was like no dialogue. It was just like text wall and then pretty art. But yeah, the art was lovely. Yeah, I love the Art Deco style that he has, and uh, I love his use of shadow. Uh, I know Johnny had mentioned this in the previous episode regarding the first volume, but his way of drawing hands is amazing. His art is just phenomenal. His use of of just even the comic panels, they don't have borders uh, traditionally. Uh, there's just white space, which I loved. and Yeah, it's more painterly. Right, and we can get into it when we get into the story, but uh, the the later half of the second volume, uh, is actually pretty creative. It act- in some cases, there is a wall of text because there's a there's a choice of how some of the story is portrayed uh, in format, uh, where one of the sections actually looks like it comes from a magazine. So there's very little artwork, but it's laid out like a, a traditional magazine. And subsequent um, parts of that story are laid out almost like an educational pamphlet or 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 what have you. And so uh, I felt his art choices were more bold within this particular volume and yeah hands down amazing stuff and i did notice that some of the gangsters i'm getting the two books mixed up because i did re-review the first one but some of them do look a lot like some of the gangsters that have appeared in the batman animated series which is no surprise obviously uh but uh yeah i i love his artwork so hands down my favorite part of the book even if you don't read any of it i would say just look through it yeah, it's a master's class on um like like 1950s early 60s minimalist uh architecture and sign design and like when the, part of the story set in Tahoe and uh it's funny how like Vegas was where they built the gambling for like everybody the the mobsters but Tahoe was sort of like where they went to go chill out and relax and gamble. It's funny how the two <laughs> Like, if you were going to go to the two, I'd much rather go to Tahoe than Vegas. Th- yeah. That's also something that happened in Godfather, right, Johnny? Yeah, yeah. The second one, they're they're in Tahoe. Uh, Tahoe. They hide out in Tahoe for a, a bit. Well, to recap the story, this is the second book in the Richard Starks Parker series. And this one deals with Parker finally going after Bronson, who's the head of the outfit. And, and if you haven't read the first book, the outfit is like the main... Um, well, not the main... They're like the secondary bad guy that he goes after this group, this crime syndicate that he goes after to get his money, that he was double crossed by somebody who was owed owed money to the outfit. Um, but he goes after this criminal criminals or goes after this criminal organization that he faced in the fir- first book. Part of his plan is exposing the weaknesses of the outfit's different operations. And then, uh, like safe houses for large sums of money, or uh, for for horse, horse track betting, or gambling dens, and he exposes this to the criminal underworld, uh, who would never normally rob from the outfit, and that's how he kind of, what would you say, like spreads them a little thin, and then, mm-hmm. and then uh, when they're kind of exposed, he goes up to Tahoe and goes after the main bad guy. Pretty straightforward story. Yeah, the book opens with 
one of my favorite tropes, though I wonder, thinking about it now as an adult, how well it actually works, which is getting plastic surgery to completely change your look and then no one ever recognizing you. You know, it, that's always a trope on TV or, or movies and books, but I, I often wonder, like, would that ever really work? Is there an ability to actually change yourself so much that no one would recognize you and not scar you? Just, you know, it's always a, a way to explain how they got a different actor to do something else or what have you, you know, famously, uh, what's his name? Michael Knight from Knight <laughs> yeah, I was Rider. about to say Michael Knight. Do, 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 exactly. do, 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 I kind of wonder, like, would, would there ever be a, a way for plastic surgery to totally change you as opposed to making you just have bad looking makeup or droopy eyes or a bad nose? I, I kind of don't think that actually works in real life. I wanted to, I wanted to point out Johnny in your, Wait, what's the word? Oh, Johnny, in your summary of the book, you mentioned that he, he goes after the bad, the big bad guy, but uh-huh. isn't Parker the big bad guy? Like, isn't he the worst person? <laughs> <laughs> he is, but he's the he's the hero, quote unquote, of the story. Anti-hero. Yeah, he's the, yes. the, the It's funny. So there's a um, there's a website that Cook acknowledges at the end of the book called the violence Parker does or something like that. The violence of, of Parker.com. So I went and actually looked at the website and that was a big talking point on the website was like, this is not a good character. And a lot of people over the years have been repulsed by the, the character in the stories. Like this isn't someone to be commended. You're just sort of supposed to root for him in the moment to, to him to get to where he needs to be. But the problem with him is he will go through anybody to get to where he needs to be sort of an amoral person. Like he won't hurt people unless he has to. I don't know. I'm not saying that's great, but. Right. I mean, it's the same problem with the Punisher, right? I mean, the Punisher is not a hero at all. I mean, Mm. he, he, he will actually probably be less susceptible to hurting civilians than Parker, but he's still very violent and goes to the extremes and is not someone to be worshipped or, you know, lauded. Yeah, exactly. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when the Punisher, doesn't the Punisher kind of, when he kills people, isn't it more, it's not like necessarily someone in his bed or like a close person. Like he's more likely to have civilian (laughs) casualties, but so it's like less of a. Yeah. Punisher is actually better than Parker. Yes. Punisher is actually a better guy and has a more, strict moral code for sure he's killing people more like the way marvel heroes kill people like oh yeah we just a blew up hero. a skyscraper <laughs> right but yeah i mean the marvel movies <laughs> well i guess there's a punish movie too anyway yeah i mean that's why i said uh, in volume two i actually found parker to be a little more tame because for instance in the opening sequence he's trying to gain some more money he partners with some people to do a heist on a uh, armored truck and he specifically states that he doesn't want any gunplay. He doesn't want unnecessary deaths, which is unusual for Parker, given what I read in Volume 1. Uh, so he's a little more uh, tame. Now, w- whether that's because he doesn't want to hurt other people or he just doesn't want the heat, who knows? I think it's because he doesn't want the heat. Right. He doesn't want, yeah, exactly, the police coming after him because he's murdered a bunch of individuals. Yeah. It's because he had a headache that night and he just wasn't in the mood. <laughs> Well, you better get in the booth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh the the story kicks off. He an acquaintance of his named Skim Lasker, who I believe is in the first book, um, puts together this this uh crime to to through a uh waitress to rob a di- a um an armored truck that comes into their diner her diner quite a bit. And then Parker quickly sees through her plans to double cross all of them. So Skim Lasker gets stabbed after they pull the heist and then uh, they track her down and kill her and then take off with the money. Turns out Skim did not die. He was he lived and was able to avoid getting arrested and then sees he knows where Parker's going to be because Parker sort of has a uh, they talk about this in the first book. He has a sort of pattern that he follows. He'll he'll rob some he'll, he'll pull a heist like once a year, make enough money to survive for the year. And then he usually winds up, he does these crimes in on the East Coast, the upper like New York area. And then he'll go down to Miami for the summer to 
to, to relax, I guess, from his crimes, uh, his heart. <laughs> kind of like me. His... I mean, honestly, it was like reading a biography. So, <laughs> <laughs> and Skim knows this. So, uh, and and because of the actions that Parker took in the first book, the outfit is still out to get him. So Skim uh, points him out to an informant that's down in Miami, and then they go to try and kill him. And that's what starts the story in rolling. Is like. Parker's keeps has said in the story. He's like, I just want to be, I, I got my money. Why aren't, why are you guys, I got money that I was owed. Why are you guys still going, still going after me? And, um, and so that's why he goes after the outfit. Debate This asks the bold questions other podcasts are afraid to ask about our favorite comic books and video games. So far, all we know about Mr. The Rock's upcoming project is that it is, quote, one of the biggest, most badass games, and, quote, one that he's played for years. What video game adaptation do you think he will star in, and as what character? The answers are, well delivered boldly and confidently. Kirby games, on the other hand, are all about his copy abilities, his powers. In short, guys, a Kirby game is about drive. It's about power. No! Oh, <laughs> oh my god! I won't. I will guys, not be part of this. Kirby stays hungry, yet he devours. Find Debate This on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else you download podcasts. How did he slip this by us, guys? <laughs> no, how, how did we get... I did it! <laughs> yeah, during that particular scene, they, they sent an assassin uh, after Parker and were introduced to, I think, the only quote-unquote femme fatale of the book, which is, uh, I think her name was Bet Harrow. Yeah. And we never see her again. She's, she's, there's a little bit of a biography. You, you expect her to either double-cross or become his partner because she seems to be interested in the idea of, of torture uh and yeah she's like a sadomasochist who gets right. off on that she wanted to really uh torture the the assassin and um was disappointed he gives the information up too right. quick <laughs> and i when she was introduced i was like oh here we go again you know parker's gonna do something where he's gonna slap her or something's gonna happen nope they introduce her and she disappears and you don't see her at least through this whole book so she probably pops up i imagine again later on but uh, surprisingly, it, it, I felt like this was going to be some kind of moment, but it wasn't. She was just introduced and she was gone. I think she shows up in the later books, I believe. I could Makes be wrong sense. about that. So, um, what was I going to say? Oh, um, have you seen the Getaway, the the original Getaway, not the remake starring Alec Baldwin and uh, <laughs> and uh, what's her face? I can't remember. Kim Basinger. Yeah, Kim Basinger. The the original was Steve McQueen, uh, years ago. But, but yeah, I feel I'm curious if, and that was a Sam Peckinpah movie, and I'm curious if that movie was influenced by Parker, because he's pretty brutal in that. Like he winds up. I remember watching that when I was like 19 or 20, and um, McQueen's character Doc slaps the shit out of Ally McGraw's character several times. I was like, ooh. So I'm I wonder if the 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 one influenced the other. Yeah, I don't know. I feel Parker's pretty tropey. I mean, he's just like this lughead, right? Although I I will say I, my favorite parts of the book are the heists. I like how they talk about them, how they lay everything out. It's it's very much Ocean's Eleven sort of vibes. Yeah, I was gonna say when they. When they do the coordinated heists to to mess with the outfit, um, I was like, "Oh, this feels like when uh, all of the actions inside an Ocean's the later the remake Ocean's Eleven, Twelve, and Thirteen, like that's what they do. They everything synced at once to go off and happen." So, so would you guys agree? As I as I said, this was this volume two. The outfit was a DNF for me. Did not finish. Would you guys agree that I should have just read book two and not read yeah. book one? Actually, you, if, yeah. if, you, if you read just book two, you would have enjoyed it and not have the baggage of seeing what a horrible person Parker is. <laughs> he doesn't display his horror. I don't think he displays it as much in, in volume two. He's shitty, but the first book, he is way, way worse as far as to like killing 
people, innocent people being abusive to women, like physically abusive to women, um, th physically threatening them, even if he won't actually hit him, just he's got, he knows he can just physically threaten them. I don't know. Yeah. I, I didn't. Yeah. The second book is, it's toned down than the first one for sure. How many women die or is deaths do he cause? In book two. Well, only one woman dies at his hands. That's the uh, waitress who double crosses him. Um, uh, and then there's several, there's actually a couple instances, which is why I feel like there was somehow a creative decision. There is a couple times where, or at least one I can think of, where they rob a place and there is an innocent woman in there and he specifically doesn't touch her. They just tie her up and he specifically says, see, you know, you, we're the nice guys kind of thing. Like, it almost is like, I purposely didn't. I don't think that was them. I think that was the. One of his, one of the other crooks. The uh, Yeah, the crooks that he informed. I think that was them doing that, not him. Okay, well, regardless, <laughs> it clearly shows. It's like called out that there's this woman who's tied up. She's not assaulted. The secretary. Yeah, in, in any way. And they specifically don't harm her, which I thought was like, I was expecting. I was like. And then uh, I can't think of any other woman that actually there's very little women, honestly, in this book. Mm. There's the femme fatale. Like I said, he sleeps with her, doesn't touch her. She disappears. Um, the wife of the main Bronson, uh, they show her like the, he tells his uh, cohort to take care of her. I was like, oh, great. They're going to shoot her. No, nope. they just tie her up and they just show briefly that she's been bound, which it surprised me. Like. You're killing. You're gonna kill the main boss. I assume you're gonna do mafia rules and kill everyone. They just tie up. No, the because see, that's that's one of the things they talk about on that website was like Parker won't hurt innocent people unless they're <laughs> somehow in his way. Like that's his right. It's that's his messed up code. Right. So like I, you know, she's innocent and not like if she'd come out of the room with a gun, I think then in Parker's mind, like okay, now you're fair game. Yeah, I guess in his way is a very loose uh, border for him because I seem to remember the first book, some of the innocent people that got killed. Well, like there's a woman who he ties up to to stake out a place and somehow she suffocates from being tied right. up. Right. You know, like there was that. I don't know. It's yeah, it's a complicated character. It's definitely the code that he has is definitely more of a robotic code, I feel like, than a human code. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Zeros and ones, not like no the code. Terminator thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I, I'll, I'll, I'll admit to you, Aubrey, I was a little apprehensive going into volume two, having a read volume one, what it was going to be like, because I did not like the character yeah. at all. Yeah. I remember you saying how much you disliked it. Yeah. But um, I was surprised. Like if, if I had not read volume one and just read volume two, I would just thought, okay, he's, a bad guy not you know he's no robin hood but i wouldn't despise him as much so yeah it was almost a mistake for you to read volume one yeah in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> there's a thing for movies i think it's like did the dog does the dog die.com or something we need that for comics because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. then i could have seen the dog dies <laughs> <laughs> the dog of my heart <laughs> To get back to the story, he winds up, you know, he's Parker, so he somehow figures out a way. He's not a dumb character. I don't know if he said that earlier, Dennis, or not, but, like, he's not a dumb character. He's just not an emotional character because he, he thinks of all these ways to, like, screw over the outfit. Yeah, he's not dumb. You're right. I did kind of imply that. I guess more of it is he's not elegant, and he'd rather take a sledgehammer to a wall than find the door that's right next to him. <laughs> like, a, like a robot, like the Terminator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So just smash through the wall. So, yes, uh, he isn't dumb because given all his machinations and how he he chose to basically hurt the outfit, uh, obviously he takes a brilliant mind and he's, he's a sociopath in that sense. But he he would much rather kind of punch his way through things than do a much better more peaceful resolution in some ways. He's almost now that I've read two of these books, he kind of reminds me of the early 
couple books of uh, the Gunslinger series, mm. where before Stephen King kind of retroactively softened up the Gunslinger a little bit, because the Gunslinger in the first book murders an entire town. They get enchanted by the man in black, and instead of just like trying to leave, he just fucking kills everybody. In fact, the moment he's sleeping with, he shoots her in the head. After Stephen King wrapped up the series, he kind of softened him, went back and re-edited the first book after it had already been published and and um, softened the character up a little bit. But Roland's motives in that were, like, his motives were noble even if his methods were not noble. Like, his motive was to, like, save, kind of, like, save the people, right? And, like, not have these... No, uh-uh. No, he's not there to save anybody. He's there just to go to the Dark Tower. But he killed them because they were enchanted by the wizard. Right. And they were blocking his path to the Dark Tower. So he shot all of them. He could have just well, easily left, you know. But then he, there would he be these, these minions of the wizard running around. <laughs> <laughs> I don't but, know. It's I mean, been a while since I've read those desert. series. But, uh, but I liked, I don't know, I liked Roland. Uh, but he's much softer towards the end of the series than he is. I shouldn't say softer, but he's, he's, he's more loving. He, he realizes it's better to have, you know, like love, have his adopted son and the family and that he's made as opposed to just wandering the desert looking for the dark tower. But I mean, he kills a lot of people in that first book without even thinking about it. He just kills them all. So I don't know. And, and, uh, I was gonna say, uh, King's a big fan of Westlake. Oh, right. Uh, his pen name, Richard Bachman is, in, is, is an homage to, uh, Richard Stark. So, so I'm, I'm just curious, like if that influenced him in any way, the Parker, the Parker character influenced King to write how yeah. Roland is. I don't know if the word anti-hero even fits Parker. Like I think of the man with no name from the spaghetti Westerns is a typical anti-hero where they're kind of selfish, but also they have a good moral code. His moral code isn't that great. No, it's not at all. I wouldn't call him an anti-hero, but I don't know what the term is. It's like conveniently good or accidentally okay. <laughs> <laughs> if the whole series ended with him being arrested and sent to jail for life, I'd be like, cool. Great. Right. That's, he deserved that. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So, so Aubrey, you, you said uh, DNF. What, what was your acronym? Yeah. Oh, Dennis yeah, said that. DNF did not finish. Oh. Do not fuck. <laughs> yeah. Do not fuck. <laughs> Do not fuck with this book. Kill Mary. What is it? Do not fuck or marry Parker. You can yeah. kill him. <laughs> he might kill you if you fuck him. So that's, that's another yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So okay. Uh, what about you, Dennis? You recommend it or? Yeah, I really love this volume more. So I say skip volume one uh, entirely. Read this one. I thought it was great. The artwork's great. There's some uh, creative choices uh, once again that uh, Darwin Cook makes at the end of the last book, where uh, how they tell the story is told differently from the rest of the comic. Uh, I felt there was a creative use of the board game Monopoly uh, and, and some of the pieces and everything like that. And so I felt that it was a much stronger book and I found Parker more likable in this one. So if I ignored Parker from volume one, I'd actually be rooting for him. Uh, but knowing what I know, I just want him to die at the end. But still, it's, a better, <laughs> it's still a better book. Uh, I would say this is probably the stronger of the two. Yeah, I would agree. The first story, well, I didn't, I mean, there was, yeah, definitely parts that I found very problematic. I, I liked him going up against the outfit. And then the second book, I li- I liked, I definitely liked the second book a lot more. So, sort of, yeah, just him using his cunning and, and uh, wits to take down this large outfit that got too big. You know, it's, they're, they're, they had too many moving parts to really pay attention to someone like him. Even though they were trying to take him out, he just he he just found all their weaknesses. Well, one part that I liked is one one of the lieutenants was talking to the, the the main boss, and he was talking about how their businesses are so legitimate. Even the people working for them forget that they work for a crime organization, <laughs> yeah. and so didn't know how to respond to being robbed. And so their plan was, well, we need to make sure they remember they're criminals first, and then you know, accountant second or whatever. Yeah. And I thought that was pretty funny because, uh, yeah, it was just interesting that they, they, the people working for them just kind of considered themselves 
working for corporate America, who happens to be the mafia, which, you know, you can make a comment about that as well. <laughs> I have to give a shout out to one of our listeners, Vi- and I'm going to butcher their name. I apologize for this. Jay Vigneshawan had asked us to read this book. They, they uh, liked our review of the first story and asked if we would review the second one. Sorry. So sorry. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> Aubrey, you should not apologize. Your opinion is completely valid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it's wrong. No. <laughs> <laughs> wrong and valid. Uh, wrong and valid. <laughs> uh, well, Aubrey, if people want to follow you, where can they uh, do that? At Mixtape Majesty on Twitter and Instagram. Check out my podcast, Bring Your Own Popcorn. But you were most recently a guest on your own podcast. I, I was. My friend had the idea that they should interview me since every episode's not been about me. And so now one is. That was fun. I did that on my very last episode of my, my old podcast. Oh, nice. Serious talk, seriously. Yeah, they had asked yeah. to interview. I'd been, I'd been asked many times, like, you should be a guest on your own show. And I was like, ah, that's not. But uh, I finally did it. Was Cino, Cino, friend of this podcast, Anthony Cino. <clears throat> Losing my voice. Friend of this podcast, Anthony Cino. Uh, interview me on that but anyways and uh where can people follow this podcast dennis uh on insta and twitter at gn explorers club and i think we only have maybe one or two episodes left in this season um we took a big break because of me and uh <laughs> we just kind of came back for the summer but we'll be back with our um yeah i think we only have maybe one or two um i don't have the count in front of me but um yeah we'll be back uh, in the fall with our Halloween special and then mm. in December with our holiday special and then we'll be back in the new year with the new episode. So, But in the meantime, make sure you follow uh, Bring Your Own Popcorn and listen to that podcast. <laughs> you should do it anyways. But All three of us have been guests now. Yeah. Oh, that's oh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All thirds. Good team. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening and we'll be back in two weeks with the new episode. Bye. Bye. Bye.